Hello everyone, Alan Sens here, and welcome to this video in our series on nuclear arms control today. In this video, we'll be looking at disarmament initiatives. Now, often the question comes up, what's the difference between arms control and disarmament? And the truth is, there's a lot of overlap between the two, but there's a bit of a distinction as well. An arms control agreement is an agreement that restricts weapons in some way, reduces their numbers, or places constraints on their characteristics or capacities. Disarmament initiatives, by contrast, seek to eliminate whole categories of weapon systems. So often these agreements kind of overlap, they're a mix of arms control and disarmament motives, but there is technically a distinction. So in this video, we're going to be looking at some of the areas of overlap, but also on efforts to actually eliminate or ban nuclear weapons or ban testing, that sort of thing. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, our learning objective for this video by the time we're done, you should be familiar with the current issues facing major disarmament initiatives. The first thing I wanted to speak to was the nuclear disarmament agenda in the form of US-Russia agreements. Now, this is an example where there's overlap because these agreements really weren't about disarmament. They were really more about arms control, but the, the hope of many was that by restricting weapons and delivery systems between Russia and the United States in a negotiated agreement, you could build towards disarmament. So after the Cold War, the United States and Russia signed a series of agreements. Start 1, 1991. Start 2, in 1992. Sort, in 2002. And New Start, in 2010. So these agreements then, uh, collectively, were all about restricting the number of nuclear warheads and the number of delivery systems in both the Russian and U.S. nuclear arsenals. And it did have an impact. We've seen this slide before, but again, from the peak in the mid-1980s, in terms of the number of warheads in both the stockpiles of Russia and the United States, you can see the decline, the drop that occurred. And of course, part of that is the fact that the Cold War uh, was over by a certain point and that arms control agreements became easier and both countries felt they didn't need as many weapons because the Cold War was no longer around. But it's also a testament then to the fact that agreements can be made and those agreements can result in significant uh, drops in the number of nuclear weapons and types of delivery systems that exist. So the New START agreement is the most recent of these bilateral U.S.-Russian agreements. So I thought we'd just go through it really quickly. The treaty limits the number of deployed strategic nuclear warheads to 1,550, except the number of deployed warheads can exceed this limit by a few hundred because only one warhead is counted per bomber. So bombers, of course, can carry more than one warhead, so they kind of put in a fudge factor into the treaty negotiation. The treaty also limits the number of deployed and non-deployed ICBM launchers, SLBM launchers, and heavy bombers. Collectively, both countries can only have 800. It allows also for satellite and remote monitoring and significantly 18 on-site inspections every year to verify that the other is in fact abiding by the agreement. So it was a fairly comprehensive agreement. It was hailed as another in a series of positive developments in arms control between the United States and Russia. The challenge going forward, of course, is will current arms control agreements survive the deterioration in U.S.-Russia relations? Things have gotten much worse since 2010, so it's difficult now to believe that the U.S. and Russia would be able to achieve a new agreement on nuclear force levels. The next question is, will U.S. and Russia nuclear force modernization programs, which are underway in both countries, will they threaten the New START Treaty? Are further negotiated reductions possible? 
perhaps not. And then for disarmament advocates, is zero possible? Or is it even desirable? Uh, maybe it's better if the United States and Russia both retain some nuclear weapons as a deterrent. And there's a, a serious strategic argument uh, about that. The second piece is the relationship between nuclear disarmament and the presidency of Barack Obama. When Obama came into office, he was quite forthright about placing the United States on a nuclear arms control and disarmament uh, uh, posture. And he made a speech in Prague, and the speech, uh, which I'm going to quote uh, extensively from, uh, was actually quite, in fact, even remarkably uh, uh, forward-looking with respect to arms control and disarmament on nuclear weapons. So you can see the quote here, um, and I, I think it's really quite uh, positive, and certainly arms control advocates and arms control and disarmament um, analysts looked at this and thought, well, here's the President of the United States making a clear commitment. He then got really into it, pumping both fists, uh, same speech at Prague, and he said, to achieve a global ban on nuclear testing, my administration will immediately and aggressively pursue U.S. ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. After more than five decades of talks, it is time for the testing of nuclear weapons to finally be banned. And of course, you know, people were very excited. The United States was going to move forward, was going to ratify the CTBT. This would make other countries do the same, and the CTBT could enter into force. The president also said, same speech, finally, we must ensure that terrorists never acquire a nuclear weapon. This is the most Im immediate and extreme threat to global security. And so the president's posture here raised eyebrows because he was clearly focusing on one aspect of nuclear arms control as the priority of his administration. So what did all that lead to? Well, it led to this. A uh, 53 country security summit process, the NSS or nuclear security summit process. And the whole idea of this group of countries was that they would convene and they would agree on various measures to reduce the nuclear threat to the world. But it faced a big challenge. And the big challenge is that the United States and President Obama wanted to focus on strengthening nuclear security and by preventing terrorists, criminals, and all other unauthorized actors from acquiring nuclear materials that could be used in nuclear weapons. So that was the U.S. priority. But there was a lot of division amongst the countries in the NSS because while they believed nuclear ter terrorism was certainly a threat, they didn't necessarily consider it the primary threat. Instead, um, many other countries, in fact most, identified the existing nuclear arsenals of the United States, Russia, China, the United Kingdom, and France, among others, as the primary threat. And in fact, something should be done about these arsenals first, before we really worried that much about nuclear terrorism. So there's a real big political divide, and there were different motives amongst the countries within the NSS. And as a result, the NSS really never gained a lot of traction and never really led to a lot of results. And of course, when it came to the CTBT commitment, President Obama very quickly realized that he did not have the requisite support in U.S. Congress to ratify the CTBT. So that promise kind of went by the wayside, and the nuclear security summit process never really realized its ambitions. And so there was sort of a disappointment with the president's agenda on nuclear weapons as his presidency uh, progressed. And that, of course, brings us to the current president, um, President Trump. And President Trump said quite a thing, few things about nuclear weapons over the course of the campaign. You can read them here. This is just a small selection of some of the quotes. Some of them are 
positive in the sense that he said things like, it is highly, 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 highly unlikely that I would ever be using them. So that's encouraging. But it's also the case that he argued that the United States has a military that's severely depleted. We have nuclear arsenals which are in very terrible shape. They don't even know if they work. Well, that's not true. Um, we do know they work. The U.S. nuclear establishment knows that they work. But it indicated that the president believed that there were shortcomings in the state of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. When it came to the arsenal in particular, when the president came into office, he argued that the United States had fallen behind on nuclear weapon capacity. He did go on to say, I am the first one that would like to see nobody have nukes, but we're never going to fall behind any country, even if it's a friendly country. We're never going to fall behind on nuclear power. And I did tweet that, which is true, he did. It would be wonderful. A dream would be that no country would have nukes, but if countries are going to have nukes, we're going to be at the top of the pack. So here the president is really making an argument for U.S. nuclear preeminence, U.S. nuclear um, superiority. When it came to the arms control agreements with Russia, the New START agreement in particular, the president was quite critical. He stated that is a one-sided deal, and then went on to make the argument that it's a one-sided deal like all the other one-sided deals. It gave them things that we should never, uh, excuse me, should have never allowed. Just another bad deal that the country made, whether it's START, whether it's the Iran deal, which is one of the bad deals ever made. Our country only made bad deals. We don't make good deals, so we're going to start to make good deals, or we're going to start making good deals. So the president was quite critical of established U.S treaties established U.S. posture on a number of things, but if we focus in on nuclear weapons, there was a concern that the president might be willing to abrogate or break the New START agreement or the Iran nuclear deal. At this point, there's been no indication that either of those things are going to happen, but there has been a lot of concern expressed that the president is ambivalent at best and hostile at worst to both of these arrangements. Moving now to multilateral forums, there's only one standing multilateral disarmament negotiating forum in the world, and it's the Conference on Disarmament, based in Geneva. So a lot of hope resides in that organization, but the problem is that it's facing a lot of challenges. And the big challenge facing the CD is that it is politically paralyzed. The CD has been unable to agree on or implement any program of work since the conclusion of the CTB negotiations in 1996. So it, it hasn't even been able to agree on stuff it should be doing, let alone actually achieve agreement on any of that stuff. And of course, that's a, a deep source of disappointment to uh, most in the arms control and disarmament community that the CD is, is essentially moribund as a forum for advancing arms control on nuclear weapons or on any other uh, arms control issues. Now we come to the most recent development and a source of significant hope to arms control and disarmament advocates. The UN General Assembly in 2016, 23rd December 2016 to be specific, passed a resolution to start negotiations on a treaty to ban nuclear weapons. This led to a United Nations conference formally titled, A Conference to Negotiate a Legally Binding Instrument to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons Leading Towards Their Total Elimination. So very much a disarmament-oriented effort. And on July 7, 2017, 122 countries agreed to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The treaty specifies that signatories must agree not to develop, test, manufacture, or possess nuclear weapons, or threaten to use them, or allow any nuclear arms to be stationed on their territory. The treaty draft 
requires 50 ratifications to enter into force, and it's fully expected that those 50 ratifications will be forthcoming. Now, there was a lot of opposition to the proposed treaty, and now that the treaty is in existence and open for signature, um, the opposition has now been directed towards that existing treaty uh, language. So 40 countries refused to participate at all. No nuclear weapons state participated. So no country that possesses nuclear weapons was a partner in the negotiations. And I think the opposition to the treaty was summed up by the United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, when she said, quote, we would love to have a ban on nuclear weapons, but in this day and time, we cannot honestly say that we can protect our people by allowing the bad actors to have them and those of us who are good trying to keep the peace and safety not to have them. So this is sort of the eternal challenge, right, um, of arms control. And the fact that these sentiments exist is certainly not uh, surprising. So there's going to be a lot of opposition to the treaty, but it probably will be ratified. It will probably go into force, but the countries that don't sign it and don't ratify it will continue to not be obligated to follow the treaty. And I, I think they're... The argument behind the treaty, in favor of the treaty, is going to, over time, create a norm against nuclear weapons. And it might well do that, in the same way that norms have been created against chemical weapons, or biological weapons, or even landmines. So it's possible, and I think we should be positive, but also I think we should be under no illusions that the um, creation of this new ban and the fact that it might go into force relatively quickly is really going to fundamentally change the immediate equation about nuclear weapon states and the possession of nuclear weapons in the world. Okay, so by now I hope you feel that you're familiar with some of the current issues facing the major disarmament initiatives in the world. And moving forward, I hope you feel a little bit more grounded in some of the things that are likely to happen in the future. So, uh, that wasn't very encouraging, really, was it? But I want you to come away with the sense that, you know, there's a reason why nuclear arms control agreements exist, and there's a reason why nuclear disarmament efforts exist. And it's because there's enough of a commitment to the dangers that these weapons represent, that even in the face of, of political realities, even in the face of all the obstacles, the notion of advancing a safer and more secure world through negotiated agreement, rather than the build-up of nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear annihilation, is a better path to take. I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you again soon.